Do you ever lead or negotiate as part of a team? Have you ever wanted to pull your hair out because you're sitting at a team-based negotiation and it just turns into chaos? It looks like nobody is in control. Uh, you're not even up to speed within your own team as to who's doing what. Um, have you ever been in a situation where you know that there's quite a few of them coming, your counterparts, and uh, there's only you, so all of a sudden you decide, hang on, you know, there, there's going to be five or six of them coming, there's only maybe one or two of us. Uh, better we round up some people so that um, you know we have an equal number and then you run around the office and you and you get some people onto your team and you go into the negotiation and it just doesn't work out well well my name is Jan Potkita and uh, over the past 13 years I've had the opportunity to train some of the world's leading companies uh, in the skill of uh, business negotiations I've had the opportunity to work in uh, 46 countries to date and I've personally trained about 8,000 people face to face, I've negotiated on camera with around 3,000 people and I've uh, had the opportunity to consult to large transactions in many different parts of the world, all the, uh, uh, the major geographies, North America, Europe, Asia, Middle East, um, Africa. And one of the things that I've seen that uh, causes a huge amount of frustration is team-based negotiation. You know, with uh, uh, many other areas of negotiation, you only focus on your own performance and you're thinking, okay, what's your, counter, uh, what's your counterpart going to do? How, how will you respond? How will you manage the way that you approach things? But with team-based negotiation, now all of a sudden, you have a whole lot more complexity to take care of. So let's look at um, a, a couple of the pros and a couple of the cons associated with team-based negotiation. So on the pro side, of course, if you have other people with you in the negotiation, then you have access to more uh, experience, more expertise, more different views. Uh, so potentially, you can come at things from many different angles. You know, you, you're not just reliant on, on one person and the view that one person has. You have the opportunity to um, maybe use many different tactics that you wouldn't be able to use if it was just yourself. Uh, you're able to use time to your advantage. Of course, here's what's going to happen, and this can be a pro or a con. When you, when you have more people come uh, to the negotiation table, it's going to take more time, right? And Many guys or, 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 or many organizations will use that to their advantage if they don't want to uh, get to an agreement in, uh, in a hurry or any anytime soon, then a great thing to do or what a lot of organizations would do is that they involve more people. They'd say, well, hang on, we need to get these guys involved. We need to get that subcommittee um, set up. On the other hand, if you want to get an agreement fast, then what folks will often do is they'll um, remove people from the negotiation. So you can see politicians do this all the time. If they don't want to do a deal, then what do they do? They appoint subcommittees, they get a whole bunch of people, they want to do a wide consultation, commission of inquiry. If they want to do a deal fast, what do they do? They remove all the people and they say, come on, you and me, let's just do this one-on-one. -on -one. Same thing happens within uh, the organizational environment or, or, or the business world. If you look at some of the cons um, associated with negotiating as part of a team, well, clearly, when people don't have defined roles, then uh, life gets hard. You know, we know we know from uh, psychology that your role in life and your sense of security are tightly linked. Think for a moment. Let's say that um, your boss w informs you today or tomorrow that you no longer uh, have to do any work. So they're going to carry on paying you, but they don't wish for you to do any work. You can, you can hang on to your computer, you can hang on to your phone, uh, but you should only access you know, apps for, for personal use or applications for personal use. So maybe Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or any of those things. So sometimes I use this example and people say to me, well, that's what, that's what half the folks here do anyway. Um, you know, you might be told, look, use your, use your phone, but only use it for personal calls. I wonder how long you will feel secure in working for that, for that business. You know, after a week or two, you're going to start looking around for something else to do because you're going to be thinking, why don't I have a role? What's going on? Are they, are they getting ready to, uh, to get rid of me? The same thing happens when you take somebody into a negotiation as part of your team and, you're not, and you've not given them a specific role. They'll be sitting there for half an hour, maybe an hour, maybe two, three hours, some of these complex negotiations. And they're going to be sitting there thinking, you know what? People are going to wonder why I'm here. So, um, so I best make a contribution. Better I say something. And that's normally when they say something that you would rather have uh, wished that they don't say. Uh, you know, I, I've often seen this in the team-based negotiation environment where um, somebody will say something and you'll you literally almost see somebody snap a pencil out of the table going, I can't believe you just said that, you know, because uh, often the way it works is, of course, I want to uh, 
specifically make sure that I cover points A, B, and C before I get to point D. And so I'm still on point A, but you've not been properly briefed. And now you're on my team and all of a sudden you start talking about point D and you ruin my whole argument. And then the worst thing is that I get upset at you for making that um, uh, mistake. But of course, it's all up to me because if I'm in charge of delivering the result for this negotiation, then I should be making sure that I properly brief all of those with regards to the roles that um, they should be fulfilling as part of my team. Let's talk about those roles. Um, three basic roles in, in any negotiation team. So we have a task role, we have a relationship role, and we have the role of an observer. Now, another interesting thing that we learn is that it's not very easy for you to do both the task and the relationship role as one person. You can do it, but it's not easy because on the one hand, or, or, or the one side, of course, now you have to say to people and you have to convince them that the relationship is of key importance to you, but you also have to be hard on the issues, so focused on the task. So what I'm going to suggest you do is that you separate those roles, that you have somebody focused on the relationship and you have somebody focused on the task. And depending on the phase of the negotiation that you're in, you can decide who's going to lead that phase of the negotiation. Here's a, a, a common mistake I see people make, particularly with the large organizations. You know, when you get senior executives involved in negotiation, they should be restricted to the relationship element. Because what do senior executives do? They make decisions. They get paid to take decisions. You know, if they, if they don't make and take decisions, uh, then somebody else makes a decision on their behalf and that normally doesn't work out well for them. So when they get to negotiations, they're already in decision mode. You know, and if, uh, if you involve them in the negotiation, they will take charge and they will make decisions. Nine times out of 10, I've seen when senior executives are involved in negotiations and they've not been properly briefed, they're not experienced or skilled negotiators, you're going to end up having suboptimal value. That deal's not going to work out as well as it could have. Because think about it, we have these folks involved in negotiations, focus on the tasks, um, because the executives don't have the, uh, the, the ability or the focus or the brief to focus on the task. An executive's primary role is to focus on strategy, right? And to make, and, and to make sure that results are achieved. They're not focused on, on the details of specific deals. The moment you involve them in those details, well, they're going to be out of their depth and they have this propensity to make decisions. So it's probably not going to work out well for you. So you've got to make sure if you're taking executives into a negotiation that you cast them in the role of uh, the relationship uh, owner, right? So they're going to say, look, we're demonstrating our commitment. Uh, th this is why I'm here as a senior uh, stakeholder, because my organization is committed to getting an outcome here. Uh, we look forward to an ongoing relationship. And by the way, I've brought Mr. or Ms. X uh, here to, to, to take care of the task, if you will. They've got my full support. They've got a full um, uh, mandate from me. And I'm going to hand over to um, him or her to, to take care of business. They've got my full support. So um, why don't you engage with them? Then you can switch over and you can have somebody focus on the task, right? The, the other role that's, um, that's very useful to have is the role of an observer. So somebody who takes a look at what's going on in the room. Right? And, and normally, this has to be a person with significant experience. You can't, you can't set somebody up who's not been around the block of it. Because 93% of communication is nonverbal. You want to have somebody taking a look at what's going on in the room. Because there's small nuances, there's small things that sometimes you won't even pick up on consciously, but subconsciously, if you're just observing what's going on in the room. Um, for instance, here's what I know. If, you, if you're driving the task or even the relationship, if, if you're busy, um, negotiating, whilst your counterpart is talking, you're already formulating your response in your mind. You're missing three quarters of what's happening in that room because you, you really intend um, and, and, and focus on the content and building arguments. So what you do is you set up the observer with the ability to call for adjournments, right? And, and you simply create a frame up front in the negotiation. You say, look, clearly we committed to getting an outcome here today. And that might mean that uh, we might have to break away a couple of times just to make sure that um, you know, we have a shared view of the approach and that we're optimizing the, the potential result for both sides. Uh, as long as you set it up that way, nobody's going to have any problem with you calling for an adjournment or for a break. And what you do is you set up the, the observer with a specific brief to do that. Uh, they might notice things like you, you see one of your counterparts, you, you can clearly sometimes see that they're not on board. You can see that they're heading in a different direction. Why do you want to continue with the negotiation then? Stop things, you know, uh, mention that to your team and, and Try to figure out a strategy so that you can address that person's needs, so that you can involve them um, in the negotiation. Well, I trust that you might be able to put some of my recommendations to practical use. Here's to you and your continued success. Thank you for watching.